That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Big Bug, the eighth film directed by Jean-Pierre Genet, uh, which uh, will be released on Netflix February 11th, 2021. Uh, it is his first film since 2013's The Young and Prodigious T.S. Pivot, which I didn't really play anywhere. I remember I had to go to the Downtown Independent, the only L.A. theater that played it at the time, like two years after its release. I watched the trailer for this and I misheard thinking that the director of this film directed Anomalisa. No. Amelie. <laughs> so I was very excited because I did like Anomalisa. So I was disappointed when I realized <laughs> that was not correct. I was very much looking forward to this because I'm a fan of his early work, um, even Alien Resurrection, which you have seen. Uh, but his first two films are probably his most revered. Oh, the one with Sigourney? Yeah. Oh. I didn't know that. Uh, well, Amelie, of course in a very long engagement uh, but he uh, his first two films are co-directed by Mark Carroll including Delicatessen and The City of Lost Children which Ron Perlman is in oh I'm familiar with those are you? yeah I've seen Delicatessen okay yeah because I had it in my favorites for a while you want credit okay you can have that which, did you watch that before you knew me? No. Okay. Uh, anyway, he is known for kind of a, a certain type of dystopic sci-fi is kind of his jam. Uh, and this is very much that. Uh, kind of a, I'd say it's a slightly comedic sci-fi farce. The basic story, it's the year 2060. Mm -hmm. And... It would seem that we live in a world where maybe like natural resources have dwindled mm -hmm. because people eat like fried crickets and worm pie. And there's sort of a lot of worm cake. Worm cake. And there's sort of a lot of advertisement around like being able to live like in like beautiful, like outdoors, the ocean. So it, it would seem everyone's sort of contained in these. Um, like urban spaces where they're confined to their actual living space. And we are focused on one house. The occupant of that house is a woman named Carolyn. I thought it was Alice. Oh, whatever. Played by Elsa Zilberstein. She is divorced with a child. So we're introduced to her in her house with her, uh, with this man who's trying to like get on her mm -hmm. and who has brought his teenage son with him, mm -hmm. which is awkward. When all of a sudden her ex-husband and his wife or his fiance show up and there are a couple other people including her daughter who shows up so all of these people are in the house when it's important to know like at this point or in in this world ai is very much in charge of like our day-to-day -day lives mm -hmm. so robots do everything right mm -hmm. okay so the house is controlled by ai and we understand that when sort of a general threat level reaches a certain point then occupants within the house are on lockdown. So all of a sudden we hear that the threat level is 7.1. So now there's a lockdown. So the house is closed, no one can get out. So the bulk of the movie revolves around all of these characters getting on and having drama and literally getting it on. But I think the main storyline is that AI, there's like bad AI that wants to kill all humans. Mm -hmm. Well, or it's not so... Uh, uh obvious there's kind of an ai uprising happening you know beneath the surface of everything and that's but the bad eye the, these they look like jim varney in a robocop suit uh which is really creepy and they uh, are called yonix y-o-n-y-x everything culminates with the these yonix showing up at the house but there are three robots that are in this house Mm -hmm. the, that we're focusing on there's like the main robot this lady who, do, who does everything mm -hmm. who kind of reminded me of Tony Collette I could see that she I thought with her hairdo in this it's played by Claude Perron uh, she looked a lot like Edith Skog in her later years to me okay so there's that robot then there's like a baby robot like the daughter's like very first robot yeah that there's looks like a little baby kind of it's small then there's like another robot that's kind of like the housekeeper. It's like a machine. It reminds yeah. me of that thing from Mystery Science Theater yes. that says I'm different. Mm -hmm. Crow T robot. Yes. It or, looks gi like, or Gypsy. I think it's Gypsy. Yeah. So there's something like that. Okay. At the turning point when and then like, Einstein. And then the house. Then the house is run by like this head on the, a shelf mm -hmm. that kind of, I guess, controls the other robots. 
kind of, he was created to play games with the children. Um, and that's voiced by Andre Dussolier, who has a very familiar voice that I was picturing him the whole time watching him. But to wrap it up, at the sort of climax of the film when the bad AI come to sort of like destroy the house, it's at that point that the robots in the house are convinced they're human. Mm -hmm. well, One of the characters, the son, the teenage son, convinces them they're human. Mm -hmm. Through a paradox. Through a paradox. And because of that, these robots want to help the other humans. Mm -hmm. They're kinfolk, right? So, then, so the good robots in the house help defeat the bad robots, which is just, it's winning a small battle because then a bunch of these Yonics come in to destroy the house. Well, but, to arrest Alice. And well, to arrest them for terrorism. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, sorry. When all of a sudden, good AI, like a like an alternate group of AI that are trying to destroy the bad AI, show up and then destroy all of them. Yes, and, the and all's well that ends well. Alice is together with her uh, ex-husband because both of their uh, other love interests have, you know... Okay, can not... I say... Sure. I thought the movie looked cool. There are some really cool ideas. Mm -hmm. I didn't care for it because I feel like the ideas that I thought were really interesting weren't expounded upon. Primarily, there are two. There is a sexual component to the film. It opens with us seeing like the Yonics performing a sh like a television show where they have humans and they're doing like some BDSM type stuff. And then Monica, the mm -hmm. house Monique, Monique, the house robot. She has sex settings. She has sex settings. So the implication is like all of these robots do sexual things with their humans, but it's not explicit. I kind of wish that would have been... Well, then the, the next door neighbor is stuck in this house with them, played by Isabel Nanty. Oh, that's right. And uh, she has... Francoise. A... And she has a gym instructor robot yes. uh, that she's kind of in love with. And yep. he kind of malfunctions at one point. It looks like he's trying to rape her, but it, later we kind of learn like that's what they do at home. So that's one thing. <laughs> but the bigger thing that I found more interesting was the relationship between the three robots in the house. Yeah, they were my favorite part. I thought that was so cute and funny how they're interacting and talking about humans and how and like how we're supposed to be funny. How do we show empathy or compassion or whatever? And humor. Like we got we have to we'll get them to trust us if we can show humor um, or tenderness. Tenderness, and, yeah. And then they're, they're but they're way off the mark. And it's <laughs> And that is like it's I like I just wish the film would have focused on that because watching these humans interact, I feel like it was trying to be like a character study, but it's too silly, but it's not exactly funny. Well, we've seen so many films, including the recent Moonfall, about good AI versus bad AI, and obviously there are some interesting things there. Uh, Genet and his uh, screenwriter, um, I'm forgetting his name, uh, Guillaume something. Uh, uh, inject a lot of uh, Nazism and fascism into kind of the Yonics who um, were told are defeated because they're victims of their own efficiency, much like, you know, I guess the Nazis. But uh, the TV show that they make humans uh, volunteer on, it we get a behind the scenes look because they say they won't execute Alice and her friends uh, if they volunteer to be... Um, on this TV show where they will be, uh, all their dignity will be stripped away as they have to do terrible things. And we see a little bit of that too. But th there, again, there are very interesting ideas. It's just not kind of as funny or really as dark as it could be. It does have some good gay gags. Um, I really like when uh, Monique is trying to signal something to Alice and she's like nodding her head and then her eye, her, her eye just, <laughs> just her eye moves. Yeah, but it's just not, I, I didn't really... I just don't think it's that humorous. And then I think the themes are very heavy handed. So it just kind of, I mean, it's just very obvious. I think the visuals I think are cool, but I don't. Oh, the one note I had is first off, the world they live in, I don't think seem, it seems incongruous with like the way the house is set up. Sure. Because if we're in like sort of a near apocalyptic time where everyone, you know, where we have to eat worms and crickets. These people, like this one lady's home is so filled with shit. I hated the set design. I think they're really cool features of the house, but it just seems really it had busy. A, had a beautiful bookcase. It did, mm -hmm. but it seemed busy in a way that didn't make sense with what I think the outside world is. But the bigger issue is, I didn't like how these characters reacted to the AI. It's like, if all humans are living under these conditions, why are some of these characters acting like... Like, they're surprised that there's a role. Like, when we discovered the head on the shelf, mm -hmm. the one fiancé, she seems surprised. 
I, yeah, well, actually, several characters seem surprised. Disturbed by it. Uh, yeah, I find all the human characters were a, a bit on the obnoxious side. Even Elsa Zilberstein, who I think is a great actress, um, in a slapsticky kind of way that I just really didn't care about them. And I really would have rather had the entire thing from the perspective of the, yes. the, the mecha, the lower robots in the house. Um, that said, Genet has always kind of reminded me a little bit of like Frank Capra on Edibles with how he likes to bring uh, these colorful weirdos together, like in Micmacs per se, which is very much, um, you can't take it with you to me. Uh, or maybe, you know, a sci-fi version of Bunuel. Uh, there's another recent film that's about to come out. We might review a sad can called After Yang, which I really, really didn't like about humans kind of emotional attachments to AI in a world where we'll become more and more dependent upon AI. Uh, so th this is kind of a breath of fresh air, but I think if you go in expecting kind of nothing and something just silly, that's great. Again, it's this major French filmmaker, uh, major filmmaker working with Netflix and I, I kind of feel this is along the lines of um, Bong Joon-ho doing Okja uh, with Netflix which is also a film of interesting ideas but I, I think having that kind of carte blanche with Netflix kind of decreases the output I don't know we need to get you to the airport we do because Nick is leaving for Berlin uh, what would you give this film? I would give it two and a half out of five I would give it two and a half out of five as well anything else? no bye bye